We turn this afternoon, congregation, to Lord's Day 4, where we confess that justice of God, which we just sang about in Psalm 75. Lord's Day 4 of the Heidelberg Catechism. And their church has summarized God's word as follows. And this is in, in the section of our sin and misery. But does God not do man an injustice by requiring in his law what man cannot do? No. For God so created man that he was able to do it. But man, at the instigation of the devil and deliberate disobedience, robbed himself and all his descendants of these gifts. Will God allow such disobedience and apostasy to go unpunished? Certainly not. He is terribly angry with our original sin as well as our actual sins. Therefore, he will punish them by a just judgment, both now and eternally, as he has declared, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. But is God not also merciful? God is indeed merciful but he is also just. His justice requires that sin committed against the most high majesty of God also be punished with the most severe, that is with everlasting punishment of body and soul. So far, our confession. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and boys and girls who belong to the Lord, Imagine that it was your birthday and you got a beautiful, wonderful gift. You get up in the morning and your family came in, wish you a blessed birthday and give you a gift. And let's say, let's say it was a beautiful, rare, expensive watch, a Rolex watch. You know how expensive they are. This, by the way, is not a Rolex you open the case, you were absolutely delighted with the gift. Wonderful gift. You put it on, you felt it on your arm all day long. And everybody you met wanted to have a look at your Rolex watch. You set out the morning in the morning for work or for school. And, but when you get there, you realize the watch is gone. You want to show somebody your new expensive watch, but you realize you've lost it. Watch band must have broken, must have fallen on the ground without you noticing the watch. Somebody else picked it up because you retrace your steps. You look all over, but it's gone. Your friends help you look for it. No dice. Your heart sinks. The watch is gone, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're sad and frustrated at the same time. Your birthday is kind of ruined. And then some friends, they come and they try to comfort you. And what do they say? What do those friends say to, to comfort you? Well, they say, oh, don't worry. It was a free gift anyway. You got it for nothing anyway. So, you know, no big loss. Of course, those friends are not going to say it, say that. Because they even though they know it was a free gift, they also see ups how upset you are. And they know that it meant a lot to you, that it was uh, valuable to you. Free gift from your family, but very precious to you. And that's interesting, isn't it? Something that you got for nothing, for free, can still be very valuable and very valuable to you. Precious even. So something you get without doing anything for it is not necessarily cheap. You got the watch for nothing, but it was valuable to you, something you wanted to keep forever. And the thing I want to show with that is that a free gift isn't something that's necessarily cheap. It can be very precious because to you, because your heart was set on it and because of the persons who gave it to you and what it cost them. 
And that's something to remember in connection with Lord's Day 4. And I preach to you the gospel we confess in Lord's Day 4 with this theme. Then God's grace is a free gift, but it's not cheap. So brothers and sisters, boys and girls, in the, the questions of Lord's Day 4, we actually see a number of attempts to try to cheapen God's grace. Lord's Day 3, we confessed we have indeed fallen very far from what God created us for in the beginning. To be in Adam's fall, we sinned all. And so we're all conceived and born in sin now and so inclined to sin throughout our lives too. There's no way we can make ourselves right with God anymore at all through our own doing. Everything we do, even the good things we do, they're all tainted with sin. Even our best works are defiled with sin. So from man's side, there's not much that can be done to make things right with God again. And the only thing we deserve of ourselves is condemnation and the eternal punishment of hell exclusion from the presence and the glory of God forever. Everlasting punishment of body and soul, we confess in this Lord's day. But wait, could God not make some room for us from his side then is the question. What if God kind of toned down the expectations from us a bit? What if he just looked the other way a bit that we didn't have to be as holy as he is holy anymore. What if he just, you know, it would be a lot easier for us to live, wouldn't it, if God would tone things down a bit? So why, why would he take our sins and shortcomings so seriously anyway? He, he knows we can't do what he wants from us. So why didn't he lower the bar somewhat, make it a bit easier for us to get to heaven. He could adjust himself a bit, right? He knows that it's not going to be as he intended it in the beginning, right? Well, then why doesn't he just lower his expectations of us and accept our efforts at good as good enough? Isn't he also merciful too, after all? Merciful and loving? See, that's, that's kind of the, the questions that Lord's Day 4 asks. Like somebody who has to admit he's wrong, but doesn't really want to admit the consequences and tries to work his way out of that. If we can't do anything, maybe God would give somewhat on what he requires. Maybe can, we can wheel and deal with God a bit about our eternal destiny. <laughs> but you realize that's wrong, totally wrong, right? Because what would it mean if God lowered the bar for us, didn't require us to be holy as he is holy? If he didn't require full obedience to his law from an, us anymore? Or as it says here, if we, he, didn't, he said, well, you don't have to abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. What if he said that? As long as you try hard, I'll accept that and take it into account. We'll just make the best of the mess you made out of everything. What difference would it make if God would say that? Just think that through. Well, for one thing, that would mean that God would have to accept sin. He would accept it as part and parcel of everything then. And then he'd have to not only would he not be holy anymore, but he'd have to lower his expectations for everything too. He wanted us to live with him in a perfect paradise in the beginning. But you realize that if he accepted and overlooked even one or two of our sins now, he'd have to be satisfied with a lot less than a perfect future for everything and also for us, his people then perfection would never be attainable anymore. God would have to accept things kind of the way they are now. Adjust his outlook for everything, for the future, 
He put a lot of potential in creation, and especially in man, but if he lowered the requirements for us and accepted some of our sins, then he'd have to be satisfied with a lot less than he planned for the universe and for man in the beginning when he created it all. Congregation, and if you think that through, that would be quite something if God did that, right? We wouldn't be able to respect and revere him as holy God anymore, for one thing. He's holy and perfect. Made the world beautiful in the beginning. He saw what he had made and it was good. There wasn't a thing wrong with it. It was made to last for eternity. That's what he had in mind, we could say, after all. And in his perfect creativity, he made it to, to last forever then. You could say that with the creation of heaven and earth, he, God realized his dream. It was a perfect world in which he could rejoice forever. You know, that's something like if you would build a dream house for yourself somewhere in, on the shore of a lake with beautiful views and magnificent landscaping, money wouldn't be an issue then, right? All kinds of, re let's say that you had all kinds of ideas and resources at your disposal and you just could make it as beautiful as, you, as possible. Your dream house. And imagine that it was just finished and you walked through it and you went through all the rooms and inspected everything and the furniture and the marble countertops and everything and you see that it's all good exactly the way you wanted it and you take it all in and you enjoy it. I love this place. But imagine then a short time later, somebody breaks into your beautiful house and they wreck all kinds of things in it, vandalize it. They set fire to it and part of it burns down, all kinds of fire and smoke and water damage throughout. What, what, what would you say? Well, still got some nice parts to it. I'll just leave it the way it is now. I'll make do with the way it is now. And maybe you could even live in a part of it, small part of it, but the dream would be gone, wouldn't it? Would you be happy with the way it is, with busted balconies and wrecked appliances and furniture and burned out, smoke-damaged walls? I don't think so. You'd want, you'd want to make sure that justice was done and that you'd get it made right again as it was. Well, then how can we expect God to lower his expectations for his creation by not requiring us to be holy anymore, but accepting some of our sins, our fall and our sins? Because if God just accepted our imperfect efforts even to do right as good enough, the result would be that this world which he made to live in with man would never ever be what it could be anymore and how he wanted it to be. It wouldn't be what God wanted it to be. Oh, there, there might still be some beauty, beauty yet, some happiness, some love in a small corner, but it would never have the possibility of becoming perfect anymore so that God could look at it and say it is good, very good. It could only be as it is now, or it could decline into something much worse. And see, that's where things would go if we reasoned like those questions in Lord's Day 4. If we figured God could be satisfied with less than perfection, then, then pure obedience to his law. If we figured that he shouldn't require of us to be holy anymore, if we figured, well, he shouldn't be punishing us for this, if he wouldn't punish sin anymore with everlasting punishment as he said he would, thankfully, God is not like that. He upholds his justice 
and he keeps the punishment. God is holy and perfect, and he cannot and will not let himself be satisfied with anything less than perfection, congregation. Because he wanted a perfect world in which he wanted to live with man forever. He created it himself. He's not going to let himself be sidetracked from his original dream. Not going to let that vandal Satan take over. Not give in to that. And therefore, therefore he maintains his requirements for man. Perfect obedience to his law and the full punishment according to the law. Be perfect as I am perfect. And he's not going to be satisfied with less than holiness. And he, that's because he doesn't want any makeshift renovation of this world either, you see? He's not going to accept any cheap repairs. Sometimes you see people take the cheap route with home repair, just you know, cover up the cracks a bit with some plaster and paint might look okay on the outside, but in the meantime, it's cheap repair and it's not going to last. It doesn't really solve the issues at all. Eventually, all the damage comes to light again, only worse than before. That's the way it is with cheap solutions, but God doesn't want cheap solutions to this world's problem, to the sin that has crept in here, to the mess we made out of things because of our sins. We might think we can do a bit of patching and cheap repair. We maybe think it's not so bad with us. Our sins aren't that serious. If God would just overlook a few things, we'd be okay. We can do good things ourselves yet too. That's how we often think of our sins and sinfulness, right? Just a few cracks here and there. I live pretty good. A bit of patching and paint, we can look pretty good again. But God sees the fatal and the deep damage there is because of our sins. It's not just a weak crack or two here or there. It's a huge gap in this world. A chasm as big as the Grand Canyon. God's good creation has been wrecked. It was so good in the beginning, so beautiful, but our sins ruined it. And we live in a terribly broken world. And we are ourselves, we're broken people. And God isn't going to be satisfied with some cheap, solution to all this, some cheap patching up. He wants a full-scale renovation and renewal of this world and of the people who are going to populate that world. And congregation, that's why he did what he did in order to fill in that chasm, that huge chasm. He held on to his dream his vision. He didn't change his mind about sin and punishment. And he didn't change his mind about where he wanted everything to go. He wanted it to be again as he had intended it in the first place. And that's why he sent his son to become man, one of us, to become a second Adam. He was perfect. He was as God intended man to be. And God's son, Jesus Christ, perfectly fulfilled his calling. Came into the world and lived as God wanted him to live. Resisted all temptation. Showed in all that he did what God wants from us. He was a man as God wants man to be. And then the people put him to death for that. And God's son gave himself up for the sins of his people and carried the full punishment for our sin. And see, that's how much God was willing to do, how far he was willing to go to restore everything again, to make everything like the original blueprint, you could say, to make it like paradise again, paradise restored. Think about the last chapter of Revelation. He didn't want the quick patch job. He wasn't going to be satisfied with some imperfect repairs which would leave things broken beneath the surface. He wanted a complete, full, deep restoration. He wanted it perfect like it was before. I, I could even say more glorious, in fact. 
And that's why God's son, God's son descended into hell. He had to endure unbearable suffering as man and die a thousand deaths at once on the cross under the full punishment of our sins. God knew how wide and deep the break is because of our fall and our sins, and he didn't want to just make that quick repair, but a complete recovery. And so he sent his only, only beloved and holy son and let go of him. He abandoned him to hell and death and raised him up. That's what was needed to really save this world, congregation. To save you and me completely. Not a half job, a cheap solution. Total restoration. And that's why he worked that wonderful, complete salvation in his son. To make all things new again. Paradise restored on the way. And do you see what it cost God to do that, brothers and sisters, boys and girls? Like we said, he could have gone for the cheaper solution to the brokenness of this world in our lives, and it wouldn't have, have fixed anything, really. Like the questions of Lord's Day 4 suggest, lower the bar, a man has fallen, can't fulfill the law anymore anyway, so I won't re require perfect love and obedience anymore. Just some effort would be okay. Or he could have lessened the punishment of sin, just left it at the worst sins, maybe. Or he could have said, oh, well, I'll let my mercy take over. Just forget about your sins. Easy forgiveness. But God didn't do that. He kept the original blueprint for this world and for us, and he sent his only son. God gave up what was most dear to his heart in order to make the world beautiful again and to make us perfect and eternally joyful again. And he did the utmost to make everything as it was intended to be, to make us as we were intended to be, in Christ, his son. Congregation, I, I, you realize, I hope, what a great and wonderful gift God gives us here. We, we don't deserve a thing from him except eternal punishment of body and soul. But God came with his grace sent his son to work redemption for us. And the gap was filled in completely free, free of charge. What a gift, a glorious gift. Life, the prospect of life, eternal life, restored relationships, perfect love, healing of all brokenness, perfect happiness, an eternal feast. And the only tears that will remain then are tears of gratitude. And the dwelling of God will be with men. We can't even imagine in our situation here what it's going to be like when it's all finished. We can just look forward to it. But that's God's goal. It's, that's what he gave his only and beloved son for. And you see then Jesus groaning under the burden of God's wrath, just wrath against our sins, congregation, see him suffer so intensely that his sweat came out as drops of blood. Can you imagine the pressure? Hear him cry out on Golgotha, why have you forsaken me? And realize that he did that so that you and I could receive the promise of complete, glorious, and eternal restoration so you and I could hope to live in eternal perfection with God. And we, and we have that given to us, free of charge, God's glorious gift of grace. But I hope you realize now that that gift, even though it's free, didn't come cheap. It didn't come cheap at all congregation. God's only son went to the cross for it so we could receive it. And therefore, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, let's not make it cheap either. Let's not make it cheap like those questions in Lord's Day 4 try to do. 
And you know, it is actually, it's actually easy for us to cheapen God's grace. And we can do that by how we think and live. For instance, we can make the gift of God's grace cheap by thinking we need to do something to earn it, to deserve it. God gives it freely. We see that every time the baby is baptized at the baptismal font in church. The baby didn't do anything to deserve it, to deserve that, those promises, God's grace. God just promises it to a child like that for free. Just as that child was condemned through the fall of the first Adam, so he is sanctified, set apart as holy in the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And so baptism displays that so clearly that there's no reason for us to think, I have to do something to earn it, or I'm worthy of it, or something like that. I'm afraid, though, that's sometimes how we end up thinking, living, right? We think we have, have to do this and we have to refrain from that because otherwise we won't receive God's grace. And then we end up doing things out of a kind of duty instead of out of thankfulness as conditions for receiving God's gift instead of expressions of joy because we have received that gift. Well, Jesus cried on the, out, out on the cross, it is finished. Finished. He finished what was needed to make us right with God again. What was needed for us to have eternal life. Those drops of water show you it's finished for you in Christ. Everything's paid for. And whoever accepts that realizes what a glorious gift it is and wants to do nothing else but hang on to that gift in faith, right? And if you clutch that gift close to your heart in faith and gratitude, then you also want to serve and honor God, won't you? You're not going to worship and serve him as a kind of a boring and difficult duty. No, you want to do his will from your heart to the utmost of your ability. You know it's not going to be perfect, but you want to be as much as you can perfect. It'll be your joy to serve God out of thankfulness for his marvelous gift. And then you're not going to sigh on a Sunday morning and say to yourself, ah, what a pain to have to go to church again today. No, then you cheapen God's gift of grace. And you show you have no idea what it cost him to give his son for you so that you might receive his gift and live in glorious and joyful perfection forever as he intended. If you realize what a, a magnificent gift God's grace is, then you're not going to do his will out of, a, out of duty. You're going to do it out of heartfelt love and gratitude and congregation. There's a second way we can make God's gift of grace cheap. And that's by not being careful with it. You can't earn it by doing good things, but you can lose it by not being careful with it. Not being careful with it is living and thinking in a shallow way about it. Like, uh, I know it's a sin, but I, I do it because I want to and God will forgive me again anyway. And then we become casual about our sins and sinfulness. And, because, and then we presume upon God's grace. We don't care that we cause God sorrow because of what we're doing. Ah, he won't mind if I do this. He, he's going to forgive me anyway. This is not going to keep me out of heaven. And then we figure God is so merciful, he, he's not going to take our sins seriously anyway. And then we don't take our sins seriously either. And we figure God will forgive us automatically anyway. But we cheapen God's gift of grace with an attitude like that, congregation. Look at this section we read from Hebrews 10. <clears throat> it's a serious section. It starts by showing how we may have confidence to enter God's holy place 
how we can go to God with confidence because of the blood of Jesus. Because of Christ, we can count on his love and grace signified at our baptism, at that symbolic washing with water. But woe to us, later on in that, that reading that we had, woe to us if we deliberately keep sinning after we have received God's gift of grace, if we know that we, we have that gift, if we deliberately sin, congregation, then it says, verse 26, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. Because what is the case then? We would show by that careless living by presuming on God's grace that we haven't understood or accepted it all. And it's like just not being careful with that Rolex watch. You dropped it. Then there's no heartfelt love for God because of his glorious gift, but we just live for ourselves and we make his grace cheap and we're not careful with his gift. Congregation, it's, it is like receiving that beautiful Rolex watch, really which we mentioned in the beginning. That's just a picture of it. You're going to be careful with it, especially because you realize what it cost the people who gave it to you, your parents, or your husband, or wife, or friend. You're going to take really good care of it. You got it for nothing, completely free. It was a gift. And you love the giver. It cost the giver a lot. And it signifies the giver's love for you. So you value that gift. It's precious to you. And that's how it is with the gift of God's grace. We received it free. Free from God. But we also know what it cost him. And it wasn't cheap. It cost him the precious blood of his only son. And so we taste in his perfect, we taste his perfect love in it. And then we're going to be very, very careful with that wonderful gift, aren't we? Amen.